This Agriculture Today opens up on the grain markets, as we always do on a Friday. And uh, once more, we're in touch with K-State Research and Extension grain market economist Dan O'Brien from his office in Colby, northwest Kansas, this week. And Well, Dan, you look at these markets broadly, and it's pretty obvious that dry weather, both domestically and abroad, is the key feature out there. Dry weather in Argentina, southern Brazil, the worry of of impact on uh, what appears to be at least not completely irrelevant chances of the extension of a La Nina pattern that could bring problems to the second crop, corn harvest even up into northern Brazil, our own weather problems here in the central and southern plains, and that's, uh, again, specifically we'd be looking at Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and also taking note, although it's too early to get excited about it very much, and, that, uh, and, we're, and again, we're not seeing excitement for drought conditions in the corn or soybean markets yet, but still there's an awareness of dryness that's perpetuating for weeks now off into Illinois, parts of Indiana, those areas of the U.S. Central Corn Belt, as well as up into the Dakotas. Again, you can build a case for at least moderate support for futures based on, yes, the ongoing strong demand that we have, but also at least at least wary prospects with regard to crop moisture and some significant questions about what prospects are for the U.S. crop now through 2018. This is giving a bit of a lift to the markets as you look at the futures and you look at the basis bids in Kansas as well. Yes, uh, when you look at the March corn futures contract, again, not that long before, we'll be to March 1 and, and uh, rolling over to the May for attention, but March futures had gotten down to about 345 in early January. Since then, now it's rallied to about 367, 370. If you would have told us that on uh, February the 15th that we'd be uh, 22, 25 cents higher than, than where we were on December 1st, we would have said, you know, I'll take that. <laughs> you know, that was those were pretty pretty depressed times in terms of price outlook. For the soybean market, we were at 945 in early January, just about the same time frame, and now we're, we're at 1024. Uh, so it's about 75, 80, 85 cents higher than where we were, well, right after the first of the year. Even in wheat, even with all of our export challenges that we've got in wheat, uh, still the dry conditions have affected us some. Of course, we had the a low of about 410 in early December. Well, had gone up, came back down to about 420 or so uh, in the, right after the first of the year. Now we're at about four. Well, on yesterday's close, about 478. Have gotten up to about 480 or so. So 60, 70, 80 cents higher on the, on the futures market, and almost all of that has to do with either South American weather problems or our own. You know, over that time frame, in the midst of the of what we've seen for weather concerns, we've endured uh, some tariff issues on grain sorghum, other uh, ups and downs in terms of international crops and trade discussions, uh, in addition to uh, tariff issues with China, again, with regard to NAFTA, et cetera. You know, it, it hasn't been a quiet, docile time. <laughs> There's been a lot going on, but I guess right now that the markets are, re- are revealing their true colors. They're really watching the supply side, the supply prospects for things, to see uh, what type of a, of a supply base we'd have for corn, grain, sorghum, soybean, and wheat to markets as we head off into the coming year, and, and the prospect or the risk of shorter crops, or at least less less than the stellar crops we've had in the last uh, two or three years in a row. You know, again, it's lending some support now to the grain markets. You referred there to the market shock from the grain sorghum import issue with China and, and what that did to basis levels. Uh, just a brief aside here, this past week, very little recovery on those basis numbers? Uh, yeah, central Kansas, of course, is where we have had had the most focus when we were running so strong on grain sorghum basis bids and supported by exports. And again, the, the kind of the premier bid in the state was the Topeka bid. For grain sorghum, it was running 55, 60 over here uh, based on Thursday, February 15th numbers out of the USDA. We're at, we flipped that. Now we're 55 under Topeka, 
5,500 in Salina, 60 under in Concordia. Most other places, again, Hutchinson, Wellington, 25, 30 under. Interesting to watch that. When you look at the actual shipments, it's not as if grain sorghum shipments in the last several weeks have dropped to absolutely zero. Again, when we're going strong, we're looking at 10, 11, gosh, maybe 12 million bushels per week. We're still running at about 5 million bushels a week. It's just that that, that top percentage demand pull part of that is, is at least temporarily away from the market. So uh, the USDA still has a projection of 260 million bushels for grain sorghum for exports this year. And uh, we're 44% of the way through the marketing year. and about, We have about 40% of that figure met. And we still have a lot of new crop sales. Uh, you get forward purchases that are still represented in the market to where right, well, I guess as of the 8th of February, we're 81% of the way bought there in terms of shipments and forward purchases for grain sorghum, and we're only 44% of the way through the marketing year. So there's still still a good number of forward bids out there for sorghum. Now, they might vacate those. I'm not sure. But you know, I guess until those forward bids start to be canceled, still you, it, it holds out hope, holds out something positive for grain sorghum producers to hold on to that the uh, tariff situation would unwind itself and we'd resume more of a normal pace of business, I guess, on the on grain sorghum uh, trade shipments. And uh, in uh, like fashion, you say there are signals out there that corn exports could improve further. Yes. Uh, an odd situation, Eric, and when you look at it, the forward purchases, both shipments and what's bought ahead as of February the 8th for corn, made up about 69% of this 2.05 billion bushel projection, and we're about 44% of the way through the marketing year. But the shipments to date have only made up about 30% of that. So the USDA, again, with their upward adjustment in U.S corn export projected shipments for this marketing year, again, through August 31st, must be counting on a fall off of, of available supplies in all of Argentina, southern Brazil, and even possibly northern Brazil if, if this La Nina pattern extends itself and affects second crop corn. So here in, in the face of so-so shipments, they jumped up exports. So they must be counting on some fairly strong business coming back to the United States just because South America just does not have as much or isn't expected to have as much corn available to compete in in world trade as they have in past years. And uh, reverting back to the dry weather concerns, when you look at the wheat complex, the USDA just posted its monthly winter wheat crop condition report, which fortifies this notion that that's a a struggling crop and uh, that is being noted in the market trend. You use a positive word at the same sentence describing the wheat market. <laughs> it's a rarity, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, we should Absolutely. note that. And I'm just joking, Eric. But the <laughs> point is that, gosh, when you look at the percent of winter wheat in these, uh, well, states running from Oklahoma to Kansas, Colorado, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Montana, Kansas and Oklahoma by far stand out as having the highest percentage of poor to very poor wheat. Again, Oklahoma, it's up to 80% here in, in Kansas for about 43, 44, 45%, something like that. The dry conditions that we've been seeing in southwest Kansas have been emanating up through other parts of the state. And really, when, when you look at what's happened in wheat prices, given that we're just doing so-so at best for wheat exports, and, and knowing that it's, there's not a lot of demand pull coming from that side, so the, the rally we've seen of late in, in wheat prices, it's almost all weather-driven. So for people that, that have old crop wheat that's unsold or are looking what they might do to sell new crop wheat, we're all that much more watching weather forecasts <laughs> and seeing if we have any weather systems that might come in, give us one, two, or three inches of rain that could change this. Uh, what's developing to be, I guess, uh, in terms of production, a very sentiment. In terms of prices, more of a bullish one. Well, collectively, you look at the price charts for wheat, for corn, and for soybeans as well. One can make a pretty decent case that the winter lows are in in these markets. You know, Eric, it's it's so much easier to talk about winter lows being in when, when it looks like they're, they happened about a month and a half ago. <laughs> so that's where we're at right now. It does seem that that's the case. And again, 60, 70, 80 cents across the board. Uh, again, what would take us back to those lows? Well, since a lot of this must be weather-driven, 
you would uh, think that uh, you know a sudden emergence of a lot of moisture to to reverse the situation at least parts of South America would could weaken the corn market. Uh, since the wheat market situation seems to be almost all exclusively a U.S. deal, we ha- we have to be all that much more aware of moisture coming in into our our winter wheat areas and just realizing that, gosh, the market seems to be really attuned to that. And we have the potential for some receding uh, or a losing of the price strength that we've got now if if we get decent moisture to offset some of the dry conditions we've got. Again, Dan works up in-depth notes on the grain market trends, and he posts those on the agmanager.info site every week. As always, Dan, we appreciate the time and the input. Thanks, Eric. Take care. And enjoy your weekend. That's Dan O'Brien. He's a grain market economist for K-State Research and Extension. And you're tuned to Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and welcome back. K-State Research and Extension, as you know, was among the many co-sponsors for the 2018 Women Managing the Farm Conference here in Manhattan these past two days. And the lead-off keynote speaker had a very interesting message about agricultural advocacy. She had an idea in this area several years ago, which has now been parlayed into what you might call a media juggernaut, to put it that way. If you've heard of farm her, you'll recognize our guest now. She is the creator of this initiative, Margie Geiler Alanis. And Margie, good to have you here. And your story upon embarking on this path is, is quite interesting. So we'd like you to share a bit about your background and how you launched this idea. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you for having me. I am uh, born and raised and hopefully will never move away Iowan. I, I love Iowa. My grandparents were farmers, so my mom grew up on a farm, but I I grew up in the country. But my parents didn't farm, and I still don't farm today. I went to college for graphic design journalism and photography, and then I promptly started working in crop insurance uh, and had an 11-year career working in the corporate world of agriculture. And I had gotten to a point where it was time to make a change in my life. And so in 2013, I decided to leave, and I really had no plan. My plan was to figure it out after I left. You left to basically look at ideas of expressing what agriculture is all about, largely through social media, correct? Yeah, well, honestly, like, I didn't have an idea for Farm Her when I left. I just quit because I knew that I needed to push myself out of that comfort zone that I was in to figure out what I was going to do next. And I I knew it would have something to do with photography because I've always loved taking pictures. So it turns out the Super Bowl was on the weekend right after I quit my job. And there was a commercial on during the Super Bowl, a Ram truck commercial set to a speech by Paul Harvey called God Might a Farmer with all of these beautiful pictures of farmers and ranchers, and, and I loved it. And uh, nothing jumped out as odd other than it was beautiful, you know. And um, a couple weeks later, I read an article that pointed out, while well, that was beautiful, where were the women? And not just in that commercial, but pictured anywhere in agriculture. And so that, that kind of stung me a little bit. I was like, yeah, this you're really right. This is a a problem. And instead of just being angry about it or frustrated, I decided I could try to do something about that with my camera. So I came up with an idea for a photo project. I called it Farm Her, and I was going to photograph seven women right around central Iowa and have this photo project. And obviously it's grown and changed. (laughs) What happened upon posting that project and sharing it with the world via social media? Yeah. I didn't realize, I mean, I knew that this mattered to me, and what I did not realize was how much it mattered to other people, specifically women in agriculture. Having somebody focus on them, which had never actually been done, was, I think, empowering and eye-opening for them and how they see themselves. So it was really well received. I got tons of feedback right away. Come visit my farm. Look at these pictures that I took. 
you know, and I was, frankly, I was super overwhelmed at all of it at first because I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? Like, this is just a project. No one's paying me to do this. It's how can I keep doing this? So I started selling a few t-shirts and that gave it a little bit of legs, little tiny short legs, but it was enough to like keep it growing and spreading a little bit. And I just kept taking pictures. And it's mushroomed now into a multimedia enterprise, if you will. You might explain the scope of Farm Her present day. Yeah, so from when I was taking pictures, I started trying to put it out there outside of the social media realm, going and giving keynote talks, telling people about it, having photo displays, anything I could to get people to listen. And and a couple years in, I got a call from RFD TV, which is a, a media company that focuses on rural America. And uh, they wanted to talk about farm her they've been looking for ways to to focus on women have programming for and about women and they saw farm her and they liked it so they had to kind of talk me uh, off of a cliff of like how I mean this is just what I do with my camera I don't you know it it was a, a jump to try to understand how it could become a tv show but at the end of the day I have the opportunity to share the stories of these amazing women with an audience of up to 53 million people across the country. And that was something that I couldn't turn away from. I mean, it was it was a way to share these stories in, in a new and different way. And so that really opened up the floodgates, quite honestly. So we started filming for this. And so now we have video. Uh, it airs every week. Uh, every Friday night, there's an episode that airs, a 30-minute episode at 8.30 uh, Central Time. But we have video that we share on social media on our YouTube channel. You know, we've got all the things, all the pictures that I still take that we still share on social media. Traditional media, you can find our pictures in Successful Farming Magazine on a regular basis. We try to to put ourselves everywhere. And we started a podcast last fall that's turned into a radio show on Sirius XM, channel 147, uh, a couple times a week. So we stepped back last fall and said, you know, all these ways that we're sharing these stories and talking to women... We want to invite people to be a part of the Farm Her journey and hopefully be inspired and empowered through that, through these stories, and in whatever way makes sense for them, whether that's radio or TV or they come to one of our events or they just see the pictures on social media, you know, I mean, that that's really what it has mushroomed. Obviously, the key objective here is to inform the public and those in agriculture about the role of women and the significant impact of women in the industry. But as far as that non-agricultural audience, do you feel you're getting some reach there and, and again, advocating for agriculture in that sense? Little bits. It's a tough thing to to get people outside of agriculture to pay attention to what's happening, other than, you know, sometimes negative things about how food is raised. But I tend to think that if we focus on the positive and I share beautiful pictures of beautiful people that aren't in your face about agriculture, it's a different way of looking at it. So I think that that woman who lives in New York City might be able to connect with that picture because... Maybe she grows things in a pot on her deck, you know. I mean, it's it's a different way of connecting with people for sure. And it is making a difference. We had an article in Oprah Magazine, which has nothing to do with agriculture at all. A full-page article about Farm Her a couple years ago. I just got done a couple weeks ago being on a daily TV show on the Hallmark Channel, which has nothing to do with agriculture. You know, so it does have this reach where people care about the stories I think it's a timely thing right now to talk about things that empower women. And I think it's always a timely thing personally, but, you know, so it does have that reach and I think it can still have, continue having that reach. And, and while farm hers are our primary audience and they always will be, I always tell my team like that's the number one, that that's who we want to inspire and empower and connect them. We have this broader world out there that it's our job to share these stories with them too because if we can have one little part in connecting people with who raises their food then yes and in that respect that's why in part you're here at the women managing the farm conference to inspire others involved in agriculture other women to maybe not to this scale but to an extent follow this path and be advocates through the various media available to them yeah speak up speak out i mean these women are living this every day they've got stories to tell People always say, oh, I'm nothing like those people on your show. That, that person's amazing. And I'm like, I promise you're just like that person on the show. You are no different. But so, 
sometimes looking at how you can differently tell your story is is what's powerful. And so I just got done with a breakout about like nitty gritty of how I started Farm Her and how to share some of those stories, whether you have a big camera or you've got a phone or whatever you have, you know, ways that you can document your own story and start to share that with other people, even if it's like your own family at first, you know, there, it has to start somewhere. And I think that's how we can keep trying to break down these stigmas or these issues out there is by connecting with people. And you said it, and it's worth stressing. Everybody has a story, and a story that people are not only willing but eager to hear. It's true. Every everybody has a story, and most women that I meet, their first thing they tell me is, "Oh, this isn't exciting. This is just what I do every day." And I always say, "I, I promise you, if you tell me what you do, there's a story there." And sometimes there's there's real power in having someone else tell your story too. You know, if you're not comfortable doing it yourself. Lastly, Margie, what's next for? farm her oh man uh so we have a series of events that we put on around the country some are focused on young women specifically some are all ages so we're working on uh growing those you know expanding those to reach more women and those events are different from this one like there's a lot of education here but our events are more meant to connect and inspire through the women that that we've met with farm her so those are going to keep growing we are trying to get better at this podcast radio thing it's a uh, I like to talk, but it's a whole different world. I can't rely on my pictures uh, to tell those stories. So uh, you'll see, hopefully, expansion there. We've got some other brands, uh, Rancher and Garden Her, that we really haven't done much with in the past. But ranchers aren't farmers. Farmers aren't ranchers. I know this. And so we're looking at some ways we can expand that Ranch Her brand and talk to women in the ranching industry. Uh, So we never stop. Our inboxes are always too full. So I hope it stays that way for a long time. Kudos on what you have brought about here, and the best of luck in forwarding it even further. And I appreciate you being here at the Women Managing the Farm Conference. Thank you very much. She is Margie Geiler Alanese, and she is the president and founder of Farm Her, that vast array of media outreach that you see in support of the role of women in agriculture. And she was one of the keynote speakers at the 2018 Women Managing the Farm Conference here in Manhattan. This week, co-sponsored again by K-State Research and Extension, among many others, we'll return after this break. This is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Coming up now on Agriculture Today, Kansas agricultural weather and our weekly visit with research and extension climatologist here at K-State, Mary Knapp. And it's... (laughs) It's rinse and repeat, Mary, another dry week across Kansas. Well, actually, while it was dry across much of the state, there were some areas that actually had above normal moisture Hmm. for the week. It was not an entire division, but extreme northwestern Kansas and parts of north central Kansas started the week with a little bit of snow and actually in some places a quite substantial amount of snow in St. Francis In Cheyenne County, there was reports of as much as eight inches of snow. So again, some snow there and some equivalent moisture to go along with that. But that was pretty much it. And as you get further south and east, the amount of moisture that was produced by the week was very, very little. The only southern division that was above zero for the divisional average was the southwest division, and that was the northern counties in that division, not the um, entire division. Uh, you get east, and it was, no, not may have a trace, may have seen a few flakes out of it, but certainly not anything like what we would um, typically see during the week. 
So for the record, the drought monitor surely has intensified across the state, hasn't it? It has intensified a little bit. It hasn't done as much as you might expect, simply because the week was cooler than normal to go along with that dry pattern. And in fact, we had anywhere between 15 and about 5 degrees cooler than normal across the region. So the cooler temperatures, that's slowed down any kind of um, plant development. The demands are a lot less. Uh, We have had frozen surfaces on the ponds, and that slows some of the evaporative loss there as well. The last couple of days have been a flip of that pattern, but uh, we are going to be a little bit cooler for today and tomorrow. looks like next week the temperatures are going to be more seasonal, so we'll see how that goes. But that cooler pattern for the week really slowed any kind of rapid deterioration, and of course it kept the wheat and the canola still in dormancy, um, give us a more time to drag that moisture that's coming up through the Ohio River Valley a little bit further west. Before we go into the outlook for next week, this weekend, the fire danger around Kansas is going to spike once again. Right. Again, what we're facing with this is anytime we get the backside of one of these fronts, we've got very dry air in place and we've got strong winds. The temperatures don't have to be particularly warm with that combination of low humidity and strong winds, we're going to have active fire behavior possible. So anyone that's out trying to take advantage of the more moderate temperatures to do some cleanup work uh, needs to be extra careful to avoid any kind of sparks, anything that could start a fire, because any fire that gets started will be extremely difficult to control. Right. Well, you said at next week, seasonal temperatures and any shot at moisture whatsoever? There are a couple of chances for moisture. The odds are best in the eastern areas, particularly the southeastern part of the state. But if you look at the quantitative precip forecast, there's a big donut around Kansas, and we're in the hole with maybe a hundredth of an inch, but generally not even that much. Mm. Um, They're looking for some substantial rains in Missouri, which they've been facing the extreme dry conditions that we've had, so they may get a little bit relief there. There are some um, forecasts for some mountain snows in southwestern Colorado, which has also been on the drought side of things, but not much on the table for Kansas. And that takes us to the extended outlooks that have just been put out there for the month of March and even beyond into the spring and early summer. Regrettably, it doesn't sound as if we're going to see a major shift in this pattern. No, the we're looking at temperatures for all the periods are expected to be warmer than average. Again, that doesn't necessarily indicate a rapid warm-up. It doesn't take much to be warmer than average at this time of the year. But unfortunately, the precipitation outlooks are not as favorable Western third of the state is slightly tilted towards drier than normal for March. The central and eastern, they're looking at equal chances. Given the dry pattern that we have in place, you might put your thumb on the scale towards dry for that as well. The exception, again, likely to be the southeastern part of the state, which could benefit from some of these um, systems that are going up through Missouri and into the Ohio River Valley. They may catch the west edge of some of those moisture flows. Doesn't look like that's going to push too far west in Kansas. As we go into the April, May, and June, and the June, July, and August outlooks, both of those are tending towards drier than normal through the central plains. And particularly worrisome is that June, July, and August That's a time of the year where we get the bulk of our moisture, and if that is drier than average, it doesn't signal any kind of drought improvement from where we stand right now. We don't have any reserves, and not getting our normal moisture could create quite a few problems as we go through the growing season. So you say you are now getting the question, are conditions setting up to lead us into a repeat of 2012? 
Well, there are a couple of differences between this year and 2012. Probably the primary was that uh, 2012, we had a very, very, very mild winter. Um, some of our warmest January temperatures on record. So that meant the vegetation was much more active. The evaporative loss was much higher. So that is one major difference. The other is that 2011 was dry in addition to 2012. So there wasn't much in the way of reserves in any shape or form for the moisture. And that, uh, again, uh, created problems. So it may be that we have a dry summer which we haven't seen for the last three years, but it's not um, necessarily a repeat of the devastating conditions of 2012. Well, we'll take some solace in that, at least this week. Mary, thanks. Thanks, Eric. And she's Mary Knapp, Research and Extension Climatologist at K-State, who joins us each Friday to get a look at the latest on the Kansas agricultural weather scene. Thanks to you as well for being along with us. We'll be back on Monday with our weekly cattle market commentary, among other things. Jim Robb from the Livestock Marketing Information Center will be aboard for that, plus more. Please rejoin us then, won't you? Meantime, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.